This webinar is titled Pharmacotherapy for Patients with Advanced and Metastatic Prostate Cancer. And today's guest speaker is Dr. Andrew Pfeiffer, urologic oncologist at Credit Valley Hospital and an assistant professor of surgery at University of Toronto and a faculty member at Princeton Margaret University Health Network. And without further ado, I will now turn this webinar over to Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, and as you said, today's discussion will be uh, regarding the uh, pharmacotherapy, uh, more of an introduction to pharmacotherapy for patients with advanced and metastatic prostate cancer, really focusing on uh, quality of life and uh, what options are out there for patients with advanced disease. So uh, just our objectives today are to review the prostate cancer patient journey with respect to pharmacotherapy, review basic pharmacologic principles and how they pertain to prostate cancer management, to look at the androgen receptor, which is the receptor for testosterone on prostate cancer cells, which is a major player and the target of many drugs for prostate cancer, to review commonly used drugs for prostate cancer and when they're indicated, and to review novel drugs briefly and therapies for advanced prostate cancer, some of which are new and quite exciting. So uh, in terms of the prostate cancer survival journey, uh, we all understand that, it's that, it, that, that um, it begins at active surveillance and goes to cancer-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, it is quite a vast journey and spans the entire survivorship continuum from diagnostic to, to diagnosis to, to advanced states. And uh, there are different patient presentations requiring different management strategies and approaches, which may involve pharmacotherapy at many levels. It is important for patients to be aware of potential side effects of these drugs uh, as they represent potential sources of morbidity, uh, which means necessarily that prostate cancer is not the only thing that patients have to, under, uh, have to worry about with respect to what the prostate cancer itself will do to them, but, it has to, but you also have to worry about what side effects the drugs um, uh, have, uh, which are going to be used to fight your prostate cancer. So pharmacotherapy, um, in terms of prostate cancer, patients may experience many side effects, and we have to treat those side effects to improve quality of life. And we're going to look at some of those drugs today. So as we see here, this is the uh, classic disease continuum for in prostate cancer, and there are many places in which drugs um, impact the lives of prostate cancer patients. Everything from hormone therapy for localized disease in patients treating with treated with radiation, to first-line hormonal therapy in patients with PSAs that go up despite local therapy, to second-line hormonal therapies and castrate-resistant prostate cancer therapies, um, all the way uh, through. So some of the targets of prostate cancer therapy, we have to go through some of the basic stuff, are uh, the pituitary gland, which is in your head, the adrenal gland, which are two triangulars shaped glands on top of your kidneys, the testicles, which are the sources of the majority of testosterone in your body, and the prostate cancer itself, which in advanced states can actually build, build and make its own testosterone feeding itself. So the role of, the testosterone, of testosterone in prostate cancer was determined uh, by Charles Huggins in the 1940s. Uh, he uh, showed that testosterone, which is the stuff that, um, that uh, is the primary sex hormone in males, um, can actually make prostate cancer grow, and the absence of testosterone causes prostate cancer cells to shrink. He won the Nobel Prize for this in 1966, and he was a proud Canadian and a Harvard-trained guy, and um, this fundamental fact served as the basis of modern prostate cancer therapy until today. So this is a uh, complex slide, but sufficient to show here that the testosterone, which is which is, starts all the way down here, when it's produced in this general direction over here, starts by secretion of hormones from the brain that go into the pituitary gland here, which is also in the brain, and are brought down by other hormone messengers telling the, the testicles when to turn on and when to turn off. So part of the therapy for prostate cancer is turning off this sequence of, of hormones over here with drugs over here, or over here, or even removing the testicles at this point with surgical castration, which was and still is the mainstay of therapy in many places in the world. So these are the ways in which we do this. We give what's called GnRH agonists, which block this. We give chemical. We do. We use things called chemical adrenalectomy agents, meaning we remove the adrenal uh, secretion of testosterone here. We have antiandrogens, which block testosterone. It's a blocker. And we obviously, we talked about surgical castration and the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are other medications which you use sometimes in early disease. 
So as we see here, this is the receptor. This is the androgen or testosterone. It fits into the receptor like a, like a key, and, and the key and the receptor go down over here, and they make the prostate cancer cell grow and divide. This mechanism is what we want to inhibit. Now, as we see here, this is the same slide as we saw before, but I've added in over here all the different therapies that we use at all the different sites of prostate cancer. Some of these are quite new and uh, novel and exciting and offer patients new hope chances of, of a disease-specific survival and, and good quality of life in those patients with prostate cancer that is advanced. So let's talk about hormone therapy for a second. As we talked about, prostate cancer cells um, are dependent upon uh, the removal, uh, uh, sorry, are dependent on androgens, which is the male sex hormone, which is testosterone, which is the most important androgen for survival and growth, and removal of these kills the majority of the prostate cancer cells. So the testicles secrete prostate, uh, testosterone, prostate grows and functions based on that testosterone. We also see some of the testosterone, as I mentioned, coming from the adrenal gland. So removing androgens here, again, orchidectomy, removing surgical castration, removal of the testicles, oral drugs, which block testosterone, antiandrogens, 5 reductase inhibitors, and combination therapies, all things that I mentioned previously. So again, these are some of the most common names that we see here in blocking this area that drives down the secretion of testosterone. And these are common drugs that are available at uh, your local uh, pharmacy that may be prescribed. There's virtually no differences between them, uh, except for Degarelics, which is a little bit different. But these all do very well at dropping the level of testosterone over here. This is what's called chemical castration. So basically, when we want to summarize, though, the impact of inadequate suppression, let's say you have prostate cancer and your PSA is going up and you need one of these drugs, what happens if you don't do a good job at pushing down the testosterone? Well, you might think that you have worse outcomes, which is true. There's faster time until the drugs don't work anymore. There's a faster time until the development of CRPC, which is the most advanced stage of prostate cancer. And basically, you have a 1.35 times the risk of death from prostate cancer, meaning that your chance of dying from prostate cancer, if your testosterone is not as low as it can be, is about 30 to 35 percent more than the average than the person with a testosterone that is quite low in castrate. So, general rule: the lower the testosterone for patients with advanced disease, the better. And your provider should be measuring both your PSA and your testosterone every time you see him or her. So, uh, ways in which we can mitigate some of the quality of life issues with with androgen ablation, because as I'm going to talk to you about. Androgen ablation, sorry, let me go back. Androgen ablation does have some side effects. Well, we look to decreasing the side effects by giving it intermittently, meaning there are many people require it continuously, meaning they, they get their injection of hormone of androgen blocker and they stay on it for the rest of their lives. And most people do very, very well. However, there is a quality life impact. And some of those quality life impacts can, can be mitigated with intermittent androgen ablation, nine months on, nine months off, withdrawal, and so on. And some of these studies, as we're gonna see here, such as this one with uh, a Canadian cord, uh, Dr. Klotz and Dr. Cook, both uh, preeminent uh, prostate cancer researchers in Canada, uh, put together this great trial looking at intermittent androgen suppression for, PS, uh, for uh, PSA rising after radiotherapy. And what we have here is that, you know, many, many patients, 600, over seven, over almost 700 patients per arm of the study. And what they showed, was that if you give hormones intermittently after radiation, you do not impact survival majorly, meaning that there's a, the intermittent androgen ablation is non-inferior to treating continuously in this particular subgroup of population. So let's, there's hope for these patients, meaning they can be treated intermittently and one year off uh, to regain uh, some of the testosterone-driven functions that they may have lost. So uh, inter intermittent androgen deprivation is associated with less hot flashes. Hot flashes is one of those things that can happen if you chemically castrate a gentleman. And the, and the desire for sexual activity also increases. So the libido improves. There's also a level of fatigue that improves also, which trended towards statistical significance. So uh, some of the toxicities of ADT are what's called a flare phenomenon, meaning that if you're 
if your prostate cancer is quite bad initially and you don't use a testosterone block, but you can have this flare phenomenon after you treat uh, after you treat them. There's iron there's androgen deficiency, which gives you hot flashes and libido issues. You get some erectile dysfunction. You can get some weight, particularly central truncal obesity. Uh, your uh, blood levels of hemoglobin can go down, giving you what's called anemia. And you have also uh, the, the possibility of getting gynecomastia, which is the development of a little bit of sensitive breast tissue underneath the nipple, which usually is very mild and only in very, very rare circumstances, usually very well tolerated. So some of the long-term complications of ADT include osteoporosis, sexual dysfunction, anemia, as mentioned, cognitive dysfunction, muscle atrophy, cardiac outcomes, and dyslipidemia, all things, of course, and diabetes, all things, of course, that people suffer from uh, who are not um, on ADT, but ADT can make these things a little bit worse. So in terms of fractures, we know that ADT can cause progressive declines in bone mineral density. And it ranged from 2 to 5% uh, in first year, but it's slower with time. So patients on ADT need to be on calcium and need to be on vitamin D. And these things are important to prevent their, to prevent their bone health. And they have to have a, a, ba a balanced diet as well. Uh, and some um, uh, muscle or weight-bearing exercise is quite important to maintain that bone mineral density. This is a graph that shows that patients who are on it for a long period of time have a decrease, have a, a significant heightened risk of fractures. So this just hammers home that point of maintaining good, home, good bone health. In terms of diabetes, there are three large studies that demonstrate increased risk among ADT users. And what we need to know, what we need to make sure here is that patients who are on ADT are watched for this, the development of diabetes type two, and are watched for things that can be prevented with diet and exercise. Uh, dyslipidemia is in the same uh, in the same room as as, as uh, diabetes. The um, patients with on androgen deprivation therapy should be counseled for weight reduction and improvement in their diet um, to allow for less risk of cardiovascular effects associated with a high lipid value in your but in your bloodstream. In terms of cardiac disease, it also has a significant impact. There's, there's a significant possibility of developing cardiac disease in patients in general, which is made a little bit worse with ADT. These are some very strong studies that show that this needs we need to watch our patients for the development of cardiac disease as well. They're also, um, because ADT reduces testosterone and because the uh, testosterone pushes you to develop lean muscle in your body as a, as a, as a man, um, the, uh, you can get muscle atrophy or fatigue with these. And basically, um, that needs to be um, dealt with by, the use, by exercise and maintaining a good lean body mass um, with, um, with uh, strength training if possible. Uh, in terms of cognition, these are some studies that show that uh, memory can, uh, can take a hit as well with ADT, but also very rare in this case. So when you develop the most significant type of prostate cancer, previously there wasn't much to, that, that we could do. As we see here, that old androgen receptor here, and this is, the, this, is where the, this is where you are over here in terms of hormone therapy, what happens sometimes, and a lot it, it, after a long period of time, is that these don't work anymore. And these are just some very specific genetic mechanisms that, that change in the prostate cancer cell, making the cell escape control by some of these testosterone blocking agents. This is deadly prostate cancer down here. And previously we had nothing to do uh, but treat with chemotherapies that was generally ineffective until recently. So prior to 2004, the treatment of CRPC was largely rooted in systemic chemotherapy, but since then, we've had some major progression in, in halting this disease. Right now, when you have castrate-resistant prostate cancer, M0 represents those types of CRPC patients who don't have visible metastases on their bone scans or CAT scans yet, and there are two brand new drugs that are Health Canada approved for this. So this is really great news. If these patients invariably progress into M1 disease, where their disease actually starts to show as separate colonies of cells and bones or soft tissues, we have some amazing opportunity to treat these patients with enzalutamide and abiraterone acetate, and we have a bone strengthening agent 
uh, named donosumab, which is now standard of care for these patients. So as we described, I'm going to just go over this here. This is, uh, this is just a brief mock-up here of the ARN509 mechanism. It, the ARN509 is the, is the apalutamide, which gets into the cell and stops the, the, the cell from actually producing its own testosterone and halts arrest of that aggressive prostate cancer cell. Similar to enzalutamide, same, very similar mechanism, getting inside that cell, blocking the DNA from, from binding and dividing and making more cancer cells. So these are two very important drugs. Abiraterone acetate is a little bit different. It blocks the secretion or the development of, of, of testosterone in the adrenal gland, in the testicles, and in the cancer cell itself, making it very effective at developing, at, at blocking to, at making testosterone so low that it really does a better job of starving these cells of their, of their food and can lead to meaningful improvement in survival. And donosumab, as mentioned, this is the study that, um, that earmarked the uh, donosumab for uh, fantastic approval in Canada for our patients uh, to develop, to get a monthly injection of this drug, which works to strengthen bones and prevent what's called skeletal related events where cancer will go into bone and cause breaks in the bone and pain and so on. So oh, we have a wonderful opportunity to treat um, bone health in prostate cancer and bone health should be a very major focus of uh, health and quality improvement with respect to advanced and metastatic prostate cancer. The last thing we have here is radium-223, which is a form of what's called liquid radiation, where there, this is an injection of a um, radioactive material that goes to bone and kills the prostate cancer within bone. These things are not without side effects, and you need to have full discussions with your care provider before you are put on any of these. However, it is very important that these things be brought up in the armamentarium of what we have for advanced and metastatic prostate cancer today. This is just the trial that showed the improvement of survival with radium-223 in advanced patients. And that's all I have for you today. Uh, this is a brief overview of um, prostate cancer uh, pharmacotherapy. There's many more things we could talk about. Each one of these slides can be the subject of an hour long conversation. Uh, I, uh, I'm pr privileged to be able to give you this information today. Uh, there are uh, many questions that I'm very willing to ha and happy to answer. And as you well know, Prostate Cancer Canada is the place to go for your resources for prostate cancer, uh, both advanced and localized, um, wonderful people doing wonderful work, and it is certainly a privilege and uh, an honor for me to collaborate with them on this initiative. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you so much, Andrew. And at this time, I would like to remind our viewers that if you're looking for further information regarding prostate cancer care, please visit our website where you can download and order our various resources. Please note there are also resources attached to this webinar on the bottom right of your screen. If you're interested in viewing more webinars, please visit www.prostatecancer.ca slash expert angle. And once again, thank you, Andrew. This now concludes today's presentation and we thank you all for joining.